Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I doubt whether Ahmad Didat really needs any introduction. But what I would like to say is that we are perhaps fortunate to have Brother Ahmad Didat with us so soon after an extensive tour of the Arab countries. And we did not want to lose or miss the opportunity and that is why we grabbed him for the Peninsula tour. And we really arranged it over a very few days. And nevertheless, the fact that the tour here was arranged over a few days, in no ways will it detract from the quality of the lecture. I think it will even be better. Ahmadinejad has been lecturing on these topics for many years and obviously by constant study and constant practice we feel he has even improved further. The lecture tonight is Muhammad the natural successor to Christ and this follows on last night's lecture in the Weinberg Civic what the Bible says about Muhammad. There are more lectures every evening until Tuesday evening, all over the peninsula, even in Cape Town, in the city hall on Saturday night. After the lecture, there will be question time. And people tend to forget my request for the manner in which the questions should be conducted, so I won't mention it now. When question time comes, I will then ask you to obey certain basic rules. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Ahmad Didat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال عيسى ابن مريم يا بني إسرائيل إني رسول الله إليكم مصدقا لما بين يدي من التوراة ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين صدق الله صدق الله العظيم مستر تشيرمان اند ماي ديير برادرز اند سيسترز ذا سبجكت اوف ذس ايفنينغ ستوك محمد بيس بي ابون هيم ذا ناتشرال سكسيسر تو كرايست بيس بي ابون هيم ات كرييتس ان انترست تو ان ويتش واي is the prophet of Islam a successor to Jesus Christ. Now, succession are of many kinds. There is a succession by inheritance. A son inherits his father's patrimony, his riches, his position. The king, on his demise, passes over that honor to the prince who becomes a king in turn. That is by heritage. One succeeds another. Then we have in countries like the United States, Britain, and in a way South Africa, where they have succession of rulership by election. And there is another succession by selection. There is another succession by appointment. You know, a man appoints a manager, and if he's not satisfied, he changes him for another manager. He appoints a person. Now, how does one prophet succeed another? One messenger of God succeed another messenger of God. None of these methods are employed. 
It is Allah Bari Ta'ala, God Almighty Himself. He chooses His messengers and He uses His own standards. His standards are not our standards. We might find fault according to our limited understanding. Moses, the Holy Prophet Moses, God chose him. And you know, he was a stutterer. He used to stutter. Then he was also, he had killed an Egyptian. He was a, a fugitive from justice. And God chose him. He said, now why did he go and choose a man like that? Jesus Christ, he couldn't even show his father because he was born miraculously. And because of that, insinuations were hurled at Mary, his mother, and at him. So why did God go and choose a person like that? Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a poor shepherd lad, looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats, up to the age of 40, except for the fact that his people respected him, before the age of 40, had he died, we would never have heard of his name. Because it was after the age of 40 that Allah Bari Tala chooses him, appoints him as his messenger. So, prophethood is bestowed by God Almighty according to his own wisdom and knowledge. Now, in the ayah that I have read to you from the Holy Quran, in this ayah, Allah Bari Ta'ala tells us that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, he had foretold the coming of our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There was a prophecy. Last night we were dealing with the prophecy from the words of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam that God Almighty inspired him to speak about a prophet like himself, like unto thee, like you, like Moses. We were dealing with that last night. Tonight we are going to deal with the words of Jesus Christ himself. Now what did he have to say about the coming of our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa And in this, the verse that I have read to you, I read to you from Surah Saf, Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse 6. Last night I explained to my brothers and sisters that how to find these verses in the Quran. If you have a translation more especially the one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. You see, it has a very comprehensive index. Unlike other translations, this index is so comprehensive. And anything that you want to know in the Quran, you open the index and you browse through and everything is on your fingertips. Like I said, this is from Surah Saf. You want to know where is Surah Saf in this encyclopedia of about 2,000 pages? Where are you going to find it? So open the index and you find under S, Saf, S-A-F-F, -F, Saf. And it will tell you chapter 61. So very easy to find 61 because 61, 62 is all written on the top of the page. Then another way you can find what I'm talking about. He says, now look, this is a prophecy made by Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ. So you open J and the J in the index and you look for Jesus. And you'll find under the subject Jesus, about the last item in the list, it says prophesied Ahmad. That's another name for our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophesied Ahmad means he foretold about the coming of our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Chapter 61, verse 6. So you found it again. How to find it? Very easily in this book. Then you want to look another way you can still find this subject in this Quran. You will open under M, Muhammad. Everything dealing with our Nabi Akari, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. So you'll come, you'll see there, foretold by Jesus. So you'll find it under Surah Saf. You'll find it under the heading Jesus. You'll find it under the heading Muhammad. Foretold by Jesus, chapter 61, verse 6. Foretold by Moses, chapter 46, verse 10. Easy. You want to know about marriage, about divorce, about heaven, about hell. What do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. And I say that every Muslim and non-Muslim must have this book. You owe it to yourself. And it is so cheap. It is the cheapest book that you can buy on earth today. An encyclopedia of 2,000 pages, 7 rands 50 or 2 for 10 rands. 
You can join forces with a brother of yours, two for 10 rands, five rands each. There is not another book on earth, 2,000 pages you can buy today for that price. And if you can't afford it, Muslims as well as non-Muslims, please write to me and tell me why I should give you one for nothing. That's all. We don't want to know your bank balance and we don't know how you squander your money. That's not our business. You just write and tell us, this is a look, my name is so-and-so, and look, I can't afford it. That's all. You can't afford it, you'll get one for nothing. Poster from, from Durban, inshallah. My addresses are there. Every booklet that you have got, the address is there. Every pamphlet that you received, the address is there. So now in this verse that I read to you, from Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse 6, Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَا And behold, Jesus, the son of Mary, said, Ya Bani Israela, so all children of Israel, speaking to the Jews, his own people, Inni Rasulullahi Laikum, so most certainly I am the messenger of God sent to you, Jews, for the Jews. He came for the Jews. That's what he says. Inni Rasulullahi Laikum, Musaddiqallima Baina Yadaya. Confirming the revelation which came before me in the Torah. Torah. Torah in Hebrew, Torah in Arabic, which are the revelation that was given to Hazrat Musa. Confirming the revelation which came before me in the Torah. And giving glad tidings, good news, of a messenger to come after me whose name shall be Ahmad which is another name for Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa But when he came with clear-cut evidence, قَالُوا هَذَا سَحْرُ mubin. They said, this is evidence, sorcery, magic, trickery. This is the sickness of man. When a man of God comes along, he presents his credentials, his life, his message. These are the credentials. When they are presented, they say, well, this man is like Jesus Christ. They talk about him in the Bible, that he's casting out devils with, this, with shaitan's help, Bilzebub. This is the insinuation, the allegation they made against him in the book, that this shaitan is helping him to do his miracles. So this is man. This is magic. This is trickery. This is forgery and so on. But now we are going to analyze this verse tonight. And we will find, alhamdulillah, that each and every phrase stands true to history, stands true to whatever the Christians or the Jews in the records which is mentioned, there is no way out for them. We start. Number one, he says, Ya Bani Israela, he says, O children of Israel, O Jews, inni Rasulullah ilaykum. I am the messenger of God sent to you, the Jews. Is that true or false? When we may say this, the Christian will say, no, this is false. He came for the whole of mankind. We say, let us have a look at your book. Because this is again secret Allah Bari Ta'ala is giving us in the Holy Quran that whenever anybody makes a claim, any claim, you tell them, Qul hatu burhanakum. It says, produce your evidence, your burhan, your proof. In kuntum sadiqin, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your certificate. Your proof, burhan. So, we says, now this is the claim, Allah says, that he was sent to the Jews only. Do we find confirmation of that in the Christian Bible? Definitely. Definitely. We don't have to add a word. We don't have to take out a phrase. Nothing. We just make them to open Matthews chapter 10 verses 5 and 6. And you read there. You read there. These 12, means his 12 disciples. Jesus sent forth. He sent them out. And commanded them saying, this is what he told them. Go ye not. Don't go into the way of the Gentiles. Gentiles means non-Jews. In the original 
Hebrew language, goyim. Goyim means unclean, dirty, filthy people. Don't go to them. Filthy, dirty rubbish. Don't go to them. The Gentiles. Gentiles means goyim. Goyim means unclean. We say napak lo. Napak kon. Unclean people. Don't go to them. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not. Don't go. But go ye rather. But go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who you? The Africana? The colored? Who? The Indian? The Bantu? Who is the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Who? The Jews. Let them open their books and read that and say, look, come and tell us whether you are that lost sheep that he came for. He's telling his disciples, don't go to these people, these filthy, dirty, unclean people. Don't go to them. Go only to the Jews. That's what he said, supposed to have said. I can't believe a man of God will call people, you know, filthy, dirty people. But now, this is what we read in the Christian scriptures. Then again, in Matthew chapter 15, Verse 22, it says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came and cried unto him, to Jesus, came and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. My daughter is seriously possessed with the devil. Shaitan has got rid hold of my child. Have mercy on me. Heal my child. A woman of Canaan, not a Jew, a non-Jew. A Gentile. But he answered her not a word. Jesus didn't utter one word to her. Actually, he turned his face away. He answered her not a word, not one word. The woman is crying. Her child is dying. Please help my child. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came the disciples of Jesus, and begged him. These disciples are begging him, saying, send her away, means do her a favor, do her, you know, heal her daughter and let her go. For she crieth after us, she won't let us go, she's holding on to us. But he answered and said, now Jesus says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You, the Africana, you colored, you Indian? You Bantu? Who? You are the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews? Look, this is, he said, I am not sent. <laughs> I don't know. How, how can I make it simpler? Whether this English, you know, whether people understand or not, you know, it, at the end of the lecture, I find people come forward as if they haven't heard a word. You know, this type of an intoxication that takes over, possesses certain of our brethren. Intoxication, not, not alcohol. It's another type of intoxication. The man is listening and says, look, this is, you must come and tell me that this is not so in my Bible. It is not there. That's all. That you are lying. Expose me to the public. He said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. Check it out in your own Bibles. In Afrikaans, in English, in Zulu. Any language that you can read, open and see. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him. Still, drowning woman clutching at straws. The life of her child is at stake. And she knows that this man has got mysterious powers. He can heal. So she begs to him. The other Bible says she worshipped him like a god. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, Jesus answered and said, it is not fair, it is not meat, it is not fitting to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Take the children's bread means the blessing, spiritual blessings God for his own children, for the Jews, and give it to the dogs. It is not fitting, he says. It is not meat, it's not fitting. It's not fair to give my children's bread and give it to dogs. Who dogs? Not those dogs with four legs, canines. No, no, no. Human dogs. This is what the Bible records. Matthew chapter 15, verse 26. Then he calls the non-Jews, 
dogs and pigs. Made by his father. The father in heaven made us all. But this son of the father, as the Christians say, he says, give not, give not that which is holy unto dogs. The holy things, the spiritual blessings, the message of God, don't give it to dogs. And neither cast your pearls before swine. Dogs and pigs, swines. Don't give it to dogs and your, your pearls, spiritual blessing, don't give it to the swines. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you, attack you, tear you to pieces. Don't give it to the dogs and pigs. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. This is what the Christian book records. You see, it seems very harsh, very hard when I'm talking. But I said, look, these are not my words. I didn't call people dogs and pigs. This is your record. I'm only reading what is written there. You must tell me that I'm lying. Expose my lies to the people. I said, look, this guy's lying. There's no such thing in my book. I open it for you, the book that you're holding under your arm. And they always have it under their arm. I said, bring that book, the one you have under your arm, not this one that I have got on the table. And I'll show it to you in that book. And invectives, abuses against the elders of his people. He calls them, ye generation of vipers, you snakes, ye whited sepulchres, ye wicked and adulterous generations, the haram core com, ye hypocrites, ye munafics. <laughs> this is all in the book. This is how he addressed the learned men of his people, the learned men of Israel. This is all according to the Christian scriptures. He did not even spare his own mother. According to this book, he calls his mother woman, woman, as if there was no word mother in his language. Look, this is what the Bible says. It says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Another occasion, he had become world famous, great orator like Billy Graham, or like Ahmad Didat, something better than that. And he's lecturing from place to place, like last night I was somewhere. I can't even remember the names. Tonight I'm here, tomorrow night somewhere else, and next night somewhere else. And imagine, my mother and my brothers are looking for me, this great Ahmad Didat. And they eventually corner me somewhere, they get me. So they send a message. My mother is too shabbily dressed to come in front of you all. So she sends a message. He said, look, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside for you. When you're finished, please. Give them some little attention. So somebody comes and whispers in his ears. He says, you know, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside for you. When you're finished, you can attend to them. So he blurts out, according to the scripture, so who is my mother and who are my brethren? Who is my mother and who are my brethren? He says, this is my mother and these are my brethren. The people who went and sold him for a few miserable pieces of silver. The other guy cursed, abused, and swore him. They all left him in the lurch when he was mostly in need. He said, this is my mother and these are my brethren. I'm asking if you were that mother, if you were that mother, carried him for nine months, hmm, breastfed him for two years, and all the insults you bore for him, and now your great Billy Graham, your great Ahmad Didat says, who is my mother and who am I my brother? Befitting a man of God? So this is what the scriptures record. But when I say, you now you are making a mockery of our religion. I say, look, this is what your book says. Tell me now how you account for this behavior of a mighty messenger of God. The Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet Muhammad comes to the rescue. He comes to the rescue. In Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 32, Allah makes our Nabi to say, about Jesus Christ. He said, And he has made me kind to my mother. And he has not made me overbearing or miserable, insulting people. No. This is what the Quran, the Holy Prophet Muhammad comes along to rescue Jesus Christ and his mother from the calumnies of his enemies. So these are not friends talking. No decent man will treat his mother like that. He said, Jesus said, 
Honor your father and your mother, and whosoever dishonoreth his father or his mother, let him die the death. Kill the rubbish. And you expect him to behave like that? He's telling you, you must respect your father and your mother. And if you disrespect, like, kill him. The rubbish. So the swine, kill him. This is what he said. Kill the fellow. He deserves to death. And yet, we find out that he is blurting out things, hurting the elders of his people, hurting his own mother. The Quran says, no, he never did any such thing. He was kind to his mother and not overbearing or miserable. The verse continues. And confirming the revelation which came before me. Do you find confirmation of that? Yes, in their book. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. It says, Think not that I, I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, most assuredly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. One jot, jot is a yot in, in Hebrew, is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, like our Hamza. You know the little Hamza? Yot in Hebrew is the smallest letter. It's not even that or one tittle, you know, that little mark you put on top of the T to make it T. Not even that amount is to go out of the law till all be fulfilled. He said, whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He said, it's come to confirm the law that came before him. The Quran says that. And the Christian scripture confirms. And the verse, it's a one verse. These are different phrases I'm using from the, the last phrase. And giving glad tidings, good news, of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. Other, another name for Muhammad. Now we are searching in the Christian scriptures, and we don't find the name Ahmad, and we don't find the name Muhammad. So when we tell them, we say, look, the Quran says, so it says the, they attribute a lie to the Quran, Muhammad was lying. So we have to find out, we have to search. And in this research, I have come across a verse, verses, words of Jesus, that when we analyze those verses, we find a fulfillment of this expression also, that he did prophesy the coming of a somebody after him, which we say was Ahmad or Muhammad. Where do we find that? We find that in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It is necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. The Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. John 16, 7. Now, the word there is Comforter. Some translations say Advocate. Some say counselor. That's all in English. But we know that Jesus Christ didn't speak English. Or did he? Then we take the Bible of the ruling race, our Afrikaner brethren, in Afrikaans. And in Afrikaans, it says, Mar exa yele di var hate. So nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for yalla, for that ek wakhan, that it is expedient for you that I go away. One does ek ni wakhan ni, shall the truester ni na yalla kom ni or ni. Maras ek wakhan shall it kom na yalla steer. He used the word truester, truester, the truester. 
Did you speak Afrikaans? Jesus, did you speak Afrikaans? Huh? We take the Zulu Bible. He says, um, togo zi, zi. I know he didn't speak Zulu. When we take the Arabic Bible, he says, Muazzi. Muazzi. He didn't speak Arabic. And you carry on. There are 2,000 different languages in which the Bible is to be found today. 2,000. And 2,000 different names. Imagine 2,000 different names. Every Bible, different word. Every Bible, different word. We want to know what did he say? Did he say comforter? Did he say thruster? Did he say mtogozisi? Did he say muazzi? What did he say? You see, the Christians have developed a sickness. A sickness of changing, translating names of people, which you have no right to do. You have no right to translate people's names. A proper name is a proper name. Didat is didat. You can't, you know, you say, well, didat in Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Didat is didat. So they change the name Yeshua. Esau, Esau in Hebrew, classical Yeshua, they change it to Jesus. Jesus is a Latinized form of the Hebrew word Esau. You see, Jesus in his second coming, if he comes and if people recognize him, I say, shout, Jesus, Jesus. I say, hey, he won't even turn to look at you. Because he never heard the word Jesus in his life. He never heard the word Jesus. He said, Christ, Christ. I said, look, he'll never turn to look at you because he never heard the word Christ in his life. These are translations. He said, I am the Messiah, translated Christ. Coming from the Greek word Christos. He never heard the word. This is later on. This is what people did to his name. So they call him Jesus. He never heard it. Christ, he never heard it. So Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. He didn't know what you shouting. Well, who you call him? He never heard the terms. But they translated the names. Jesus tells his disciple Simon. He said, Simon, thou art Kephas. Kephas means you are like a rock. And on this rock I'll build my church. You are like a rock. You know, not steady fellow like a fighting Irish man. His name is Simon. So he said, thou art Kephas. In his own mother tongue, you are Kephas. Like a rock, you. So they translated Kephas into Petros, into Greek. And from Petros, they got Peter. Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. Imagine. They have Saint Peter in Rome. I say it should be Saint Simon in Rome. Look, it's some rhymes. Then the 13th self-appointed disciple, apostle of Jesus, self-appointed. Jesus Christ meets him on the way on the Damascus road, as Paul says. He said, I heard a voice, Paul says, in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 14. He says, I heard a voice speaking unto me, unto Paul, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Acts chapter 26 verse 14. He said, Saul, Saul. They changed it to Paul, Paul. I said, look, Saint Saul, Saint, Saint Paul in London, the big cathedral. Saint Saul rhymes better. Saint Simon rhymes better. But no. They must Latinize it. It's an inferiority complex that all subject nations have. You want to make your name sound like that of your ruling race. We are not exempt from that sickness. It's, it's, a, it's a psychological thing. When somebody is ruling you, your bosses, we want to also change our names to sound like our bosses' names. We have beautiful names, Fatima, we say Tima. We have Yusuf, we say Joe, Joseph, Joe. Don't we do that? Same sickness. The Christians had it, now we are cultivating it. With a Khadija says, what is that? What do you call it? Now, this is the sickness. You see, you don't want to be recognized as a Muslim, says a Tima, Tima. Instead of Fatima, daughter of the Prophet, وسلم, the leader of the women of paradise, beautiful name, remember. We would say Tima. We would say Job. May Allah save us from that sickness. It's a sickness, old sickness, but we must be on guard. 
the Christians, what they did was they changed the names Esau to Jesus. They changed the name Christ, Messiah, Messiah to Christ. Saul to Paul. Kephas to Peter. So they must have done the very same thing with Muhammad. Ahmad, say, can't you see it's a sickness? Now you did it in a thousand different languages, thousand different, two thousand different words. How are you going to grapple with this? So in his original language, in Hebrew, the nearest to that, Ahmad is Muhammana, Muhammana. But since we can't lay our hands on the original writings because they haven't got it, they have thousands of manuscripts of the Christian scriptures, but there's not one in Hebrew. The man is a Jew, he's talking to other Jews, he goes out of his way, the most learned of the Jews, Paul, Saul, he goes out of his way to speak Hebrew to him, but the common fishermen and laborers, he goes and speaks Greek. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? And they preserved it in Greek. And that is also, they call it Koine Greek. Koine Greek means the common Greek of the street. Like when we speak in Natal, Fanakalo Zulu. You know, Fanakalo. Fanakalo means like this, like that, because we can't speak Zulu well, so we say Fanakalo Zulu, that Fanakalo Greek. In that language, the Bible is preserved in what they call the so-called originals. There's not one epistle written in the Hebrew language, not one. We have remnants of his utterances of Jesus. When he is supposed to be on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That's Hebrew, which means, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He goes to a place and his child was dying. So he said, Salitha kumi. That's Hebrew. means damsel, girl, get up. That's Hebrew. And Paul says he spoke to me in Hebrew. But what the words were, he doesn't say. He only records it in Greek. I don't know why. He spoke Hebrew, but he records it in Greek. Now, to arrive at the proper name, we have to analyze this verse and reason. And Afrikaans is the most beautiful for this job. I want you to take a little extra trouble and memorize this verse in Afrikaans. John chapter 6, I'm sorry, 16 verse 7. Very beautiful. You see, Afrikaans is a unique language. Every language is unique. But Afrikaans is more unique for this verse. And you watch why. It's a mar ex yella di var hate. Dit is for yella fur de lich dat ek wechan. Want as ek as ni wechan ni. Sal di turostar ni. Na yella kam ni. There is no language on earth you use four negatives in one sentence. It's beautiful. And to prove a positive. You're using four negatives to prove a positive. That I must go. If I don't go, he won't come. You know, four times he says, nie, 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 to prove, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And tomorrow morning you can start. If you have an Afrikaner boss, go and congratulate him. He says, boss, you know, I just discovered that Afrikaans is a unique language. Is young, the youngest of one of the world, world's youngest languages. But it's a unique language. So what makes you to say that? He said, look, Bas, one verse, four negatives. And I tell you, he's fascinated. It is fascinating. So can you see the emphasis? That means he must go. If he doesn't go, this one won't come. So we are asking our Christian learned men, who is this thruster? Who is this comforter? So this is the Holy Ghost. So said, all right, if it's the Holy Ghost, we want to know when did the Holy Ghost come? Because Jesus said, if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. It's conditional. It is conditional. He must go, otherwise the Holy Ghost won't come. If it's the Holy Ghost. But we say, that the Holy Ghost was there before Jesus was born. In the Bible. Before Jesus was born, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, his cousin. He was about six months to a year older than him. Before Jesus was born. John the Baptist, Yahya was born. And in the Gospel of St. Luke, 
That's a Christian Bible. Chapter 1, verse 15, it says, And he, John the Baptist, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Before he was born, it was with him inside. His mother's stomach. What else does it mean? Even from his mother's womb, the Holy Ghost was with him. Is it true or false? Ask them. Is it true or false? If it says false, then throw the book away. If it's true, that means he had it. From when? Before he was born. Before he was circumcised, he had the Holy Ghost with him. So, it had nothing to do with Jesus going away. He said, if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. But this Holy Ghost was before he was born. He was going around in woman's stomach, you know, with the little infant child. She was carrying him around. The Holy Ghost was inside. With John the Baptist, according to the Bible. Number two. That was number one. The Holy Ghost was with John from his mother's womb. Number two. Luke Chapter 1, verse 41. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. His mother was filled with the Holy Ghost. Was she filled? Must be. The Bible says so. So it was not dependent upon Jesus going away. It was there. Number 3. The Holy Ghost was helping Jesus all along. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Ghost, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So he was doing all the job with the help of the Holy Ghost. So it was not conditional that he must go before the Holy Ghost can come. It was helping him in his ministry. Number four. It was also helping his disciples. When he sent them out on the mission of preaching and healing, Jesus told them, assured them. He said, for it is not ye that speak. When you go and speak to people, it's not you. But the Holy Ghost in you that's going to speak. So they had the Holy Ghost when they went out on the mission of preaching and healing. It was not conditional that he must go. Otherwise, he won't come. Number five. Before Jesus departed, he says to his disciples, And Jesus saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive. Means take it. So I'm asking, when he said receive, did they receive or didn't they? I said, look, here's 10 now, note. Take it. I'm playing fools with you, but I mean it. Can you see? If he said receive, did they receive or didn't they? This was long before he departed. But now he's talking about the comforter. If I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. So it is not the Holy Ghost. Common sense. You don't have to be very clever. You don't have to be philosophical. This is black and white evidence from the Bible. I hope you are listening. I'm quoting everything I have quoted. Chapter and verse, chapter and verse, chapter and verse. If you want to refresh your memory at question time, ask me, I will give you the reference again. So you can open up. If you can't open faster, fast enough now. Verse 12 of that same chapter, 16. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you. A lot of things. But ye cannot bear them now. Means you haven't got that capacity. I have a lot of things. I can give you a solution to all your problems. Till doomsday. Yomul Qayyam. But I can't tell you because you haven't got the capacity. You haven't got the brains. You haven't got the faith. It's not me. It's you. The trouble is with you. He's telling his disciples. And the truth of that statement, that you haven't got that capacity, you cannot bear them now, is writ large in the Christian scriptures. A. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. He tells them, ye of little faith. They've got no faith. B. Matthew 14, 31. He said, ye of little faith. They've got no faith, no iman. C. Matthew 16, verse 3. He said, ye of little faith. You got no faith. Again and again, he's provoked. He said, you got no faith. You got no faith. You got no faith. What's the good of me talking to you, faithless people? D. He says, because of your unbelief. 
Matthew 17, 20. So because of your unbelief, you got no belief, no iman. E, Matthew 15, 16. Say, so are you even yet without understanding? What's wrong with you? He said, I'm explaining to you like explaining to little children. And still you can't follow? Are you even yet without understanding? And when he's provoked for the E. So, oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? He's frustrated. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. That's Matthew 17, 17. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I said, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri. Harakiri? Suicide. Endless trouble. Naturally, the man said, I got many things to tell you, but you are incapable of receiving it. Nothing wrong with him. I said, how be it? How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He speaks about the spirit of truth. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. I said, now, really, who is the spirit of truth? Before we answer, we get the answer. I said, look, let me read that again to you with a little emphasis on the pronouns. He says, watch my fingers. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. It ill befits a ghost. It doesn't feel a ghost. He, he, he's talking about a man, a man, a man, a man. Eight times. There is not another verse in this vast volume of the Bible with its 66 books of the Protestants and 73 of the Roman Catholics. If they want to see, I got that too. 73. There is not another verse with eight masculine pronouns or eight feminine pronouns or eight neuter gender in one verse. There isn't. It's an absolutely unique verse for a unique personality, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Eight times, man, 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 and this one is a ghost. This one must be a ghost. You know, the Christians in in India, in Pakistan, when the Muslims started talking about this, they changed in the Arabic translation. They translate the he he to she 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 she. So, so you can't say Muhammad is a she, can you? I don't know what they'll do with the African's Bible very soon. Same thing is going to happen, I'm telling you. If you start talking about hey, hey, hey in Africans, it's hey, hey, hey. What do you say for women in uh, Africa? Say. So the approach is to change it to say, say, say. Then you say, no, you can't say Muhammad is say. Can you say that? You no, know, it's very difficult to keep pace with them. Ingenious. Highly ingenious. However, I said, now let's analyze this. The Christians say it is the Holy Ghost. So they say, is Muhammad a ghost? I said, look, in the Greek language, there is no such word as ghost. The word there in the Greek is pneuma. Pneuma, wherever it suits them, they trans translate as spirit. Wherever they find them getting into difficulty, they translate as ghost. So when they say the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, they say the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So now you can't say Muhammad is the ghost. Can you see? So you are discounted. I says, you know, making fish over and fall of the other. It's just when it suits you, the way you go around. I says, you know, this St. John, St. John, is the gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7 to 13. The same John, in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the false prophet is a false spirit. A true prophet is a true spirit. He is using the word prophet synonymous with spirit. I'm not doing it. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the false prophets, false spirit, true prophet, true spirit. And this is the title of our Nabi. An Nabi as Sadiqul Wadul Ameen. 
is sadiq al one who is true to his promise, al the truthful, the true spirit, the true prophet. If you go for Hajj, Allah take you one day, on his tomb, there is a beautiful uh, metal calligraphy, he says, La ilaha illallah, al-maliku al-haq al-mubeen, Muhammadur Rasulullah, al-sadiq al-wadu al-ameen. This is what the unbelievers, the pagans, this is the title they gave him. As-sadiq al-wad, one who is true to his word. Al-ameen, the truthful, as-sadiq al-wadu al-ameen. And the same John continues. He said, the spirit means the prophet that confesses that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. Look, he's telling you that the spirit, the prophet who said that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. What does our Nabi say? Look, he's made 1,000 million Muslims today to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, the Messiah. Have we got another Messiah? Have we got another Messiah? No, there is only one Messiah. Jesus, Messiah. Jesus Christ. We haven't got another Christ, have we? No. The Quran testifies. The Masih who is Abnu Maryama, who is Qalai, who is Qalai. Behold, the angel said, says, Ya Maryam, Inna Allaha yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu. Allah gives you glad tidings, good news, have a word from him. Is Muhul Masih, his name will be the Messiah. Who? Is Abnu Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, he is the Masih. The spirit that confessed, the prophet says, who says that Jesus is the crisis of God. But the sick people, I don't know what they're reading. Their book gives them a test, apply this test to Muhammad. Does this man say that Jesus is the Christ? Or does he say Musa is the Christ? Does he say I'm the Christ? Does he say Abu Bakr is the Christ? Does he say Umar is the Christ? What does he say? He said, Masihu Isa ibn Maryama, Masih, Jesus the son of Mary. He is the Masih, he is the Christ. So, he's telling you, that one who says that is the true prophet of God. The same John again, he says. John chapter 3 verse 6. The Christians keep on quoting 3.16. 3.16 is a famous verse. They said the only begotten son. Now it has been expunged, thrown out of the Bible. Revised Standard Version, they threw it out as a fabrication. It's thrown out. The begotten. The only begotten son, the word begotten is thrown out. As a fabrication, as an interpolation. You see? But 3.6, that was 3.16 I was talking about. 3.6. So that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do spirits cohibit? Do they? No. What it means is this, that he that is born of flesh is flesh means if you are materially motivated, what brought you here? To this meeting. Ah, oh, says Mr. Didar is going to give us a free Quran. Is that what brought you? If that is what brought you, then you came for material reason. You are a materialist. In the language of the Bible, you are flesh. Your motivation is flesh and you are flesh. Means you are material. And you are materialist. That is the language of the Bible. He that is born of spirit is spirit. Means he that is spiritually motivated is a spiritual person. You don't have the spirits, don't beget spirits. They don't cohabit. Unless they do it in Christendom, I don't know. But we know spirits don't cohabit. Allah creates them. He has created billions and billions and millions of them. Without male and female. They are not male, they are not female. They are his creation. By his act of will. So, same. Muhammad is spirit, means he's spiritual. His motivation, whatever he did, for what? For worldly gain? To become a ruler, a king, what did he do all these things for suffering, trials, tribulations? Him and his. For what? For spiritual motivation. For the love of Allah. He is then doing it for the love of Allah. He is a spiritual person. Not worldly motivated. That's what they are talking about. And he, that person, will guide you into all truth. I'm saying that, look, I have yet many things to say. Many is more than one. He'll guide you into all truth. All is more than one in English. Unless you need a dictionary for that too. Many, 
all many means more than one. You understand that? And all means also more than one. That this spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus has many things to say, more than one. All truth, more than one. I'm only asking, for 40 years I've been asking, the learned men of Christendom, please give me one new thing that this Holy Ghost gave you in 2,000 years. Any church. You have 1,000 different churches and denominations among the whites of South Africa and 3,000 among the blacks. Different churches and denominations. And everyone has got the Holy Ghost, they claim. But you know, funny thing, they claim gift to healing and challenging me. Last night, a young fellow was challenging me to go and heal people. I said, you know, funny thing, the very first gift that they had at Pentecost was people were babbling in tongues. They were speaking different, different languages. And yet, our brother, he can't speak English. Can you imagine? He's He's got all the Holy Ghost in him, but he can't even speak English. So he said, look, he's asking me. He said, you know Africans? I said, no, I don't know Africans. So he said, I'll read it in Africans for you. Imagine. I said, I don't know Africans, but he must read it, the Bible in Africans for me. I said, where is that gift, that Holy Ghost of yours? You need the Bible under your arm? Without the Bible, it's helpless? Believe me. Without the Bible, the learned man, the most learned guy is utterly helpless. He can't do anything without the book. If you take the book away from him, he's helpless. He's like a crutch. Without that crutch, he'll fall. He must have the book. He must open the book. I said, where is this Holy Ghost that's supposed to be in you? Why don't he make you to speak? Because Jesus said that that very moment, he said, he will, the Holy Ghost will make you to speak. Where is he? Why is he deserting you? Desert them. The Holy Ghost is running away. When they see us, that it's still goes. They can't speak English even. They're listening to me and understanding in English and now they must tell me in Afrikaans. So he can deliver a lecture. You see, the guy wants to deliver a lecture in Afrikaans because you people understand Afrikaans. So he's lecturing to you. When the guy is excuse that he is asking a question or ultimately he's going to ask a question. So I said, give me one truth, please. Only one. I asked the Jehovah's Witness. One new thing. You seven day Adventists. One new thing. You DRC. One new thing. You back it. What, are you, what church you belong to? Give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you in 2,000 years. You haven't got it. Not one. South Africa, we have problems after problems. The biggest problem, we have the problem of race. Racism. What did the Holy Ghost tell you in 2,000 years how to solve it? We have the problem of alcohol. Last year we spent 2,000, 2000 million run on alcohol. 20 year old Statistics I'm giving you, there were 200,000 white drunkards in South Africa. 200,000 white drunkards. I don't know what it is today. Problem of alcohol. Problem of gambling. 2,000 million squandered last year on gambling. Yet our nation has got no money for spastics. For the cripples, we got no money. But squandering 2,000 million on alcohol, 2,000 million on gambling. What did the Holy Ghost tell you? I want to know. Give us. Problem of surplus women. Tell us. Problem of divorce. Tell us. What have you got? Nothing. 2,000 years you haven't got one new thing. And in 40 years I'm asking, give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you in 2,000 years. Wallah, I tell you, absolute failure. Not one yet. No, out of the 1,000 churches among the whites, 3,000 among the blacks, they can't produce one new thing. I said, now look, come to Muhammad. He solves your problems. Not he, it's Allah, the omnipotent, the omniscient. And I give you an example, and I'm going to end. I'll have to end this talk because you know your enthusiasm inspires me to carry on and on. And there seems to be no end. I don't know the tape might get finished. See, there was a problem in Swaziland. The late King Sobuza, when he was alive, his oldest wife died. His wife died. The queen, she died. And there was a controversy in Swaziland. That how long is a man to wait before getting remarried? See, his wife died. So this was the problem in Swaziland. How long must a man wait before getting remarried? And very soon that problem changed because he had another eight wives. So it was not a problem. 
So one old lady died, he's got another eight young ones. So there was no problem really. So it changed to how long is a woman to wait if her husband died. Since that is the problem. The first problem was how long is a man to wait? But there's no problem because it, it got eight lined up, still there. Now, suppose the man died, how long is the woman to wait? So controversy in Swaziland. The assemblies of God. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Seventh-day Adventists, and the Roman Catholics, and the Lutherans. You name them, they all have them there too. What we have in South Africa, they have the same, same proportion, they have them there. So that everybody is arguing, debating. So the king says, no, I want you to call up a synod, synod, religious gathering. Get all these guys together, and I want you people to thrash it out. Discuss it in public, and come to a conclusion, how long is a woman to wait before she can remarry after the death of her husband? And I was also called from Durban. There was a Muslim, Musa Borman, he was a Swazi who had embraced Islam. So he said, look, man, we get our man also to be represented in the synod. So the king said, okay. So they called me over, so I went down. And in the king's crawl, we sat in the grass from seven o'clock in the morning. No breakfast, no lunch. <laughs> and the synod started. Synod. So... One church member comes along and he makes a point. You know, how long is a woman to wait? He says, maybe three months. So everybody says, hooray. He makes a point. He makes his case. So everybody says, hooray. Yeah, yeah. So another guy comes along. He's a Palish. Palish means porridge, means rubbish. What he said is rubbish. Now he makes his point. Six months. So everybody says, hooray, hooray. Another guy comes along. He says, Palish, means all rubbish what he said, this fellow, previous fellow. And now he makes a point, he says, five months. So everybody says, hooray! Every African is a potential Billy Graham. You know, Billy Graham, Billy Graham, you talk about here, yeah, every African is a Billy Graham. Orator, oration, masters of oration, the African. Naturally gifted. And up to five o'clock, I'm sitting there in the grass, waiting for my turn. And it came. So I stood up. I said, you know, from morning till now, we haven't come to a conclusion. How long is a woman to wait before she can remarry? I says, because you know why we can't come to a conclusion? Because you're quoting the Old Testament and you're quoting the New Testament. You're quoting the New Testament, you're quoting the Old Testament. And the answers are not there. I said, you see, this book has it. This is the last testament. You have the Old Testament. And you have the New Testament. We have the last testament. This is the last and final revelation of God. The last testament of Allah bari ta'ala to mankind. This book has the answer. And you don't have to think. You don't have to argue and debate. It gives you like let do in the mouth marshmallow. Turkish delight halwa. Put in your mouth. Just chew it. You don't have to think at all. Wrecking brains and arguing and debating. Nothing. Open up. I said, you open at home. Now, in your Quran, when you have this, if you have this, you must get it. If you have one, Yusuf Ali's, all the Qurans are the same. What the difference might be is, this is a new binding, new paper, you know, better paper, more compact. But otherwise, if you have a Yusuf Ali translation, page for page is the same. So you open the index and you look for iddat, iddat. After divorce, it will tell you. Chapter so-and-so, verse so-and-so. Iddat, after demise, Chapter so and so, chapter 2, verse 234. Get that after demise. You open it, and this is what you find. This is what you read there. I'm reading it to my audience there, the Swazis. I'm reading from the Quran. I was reading from the Quran. It says, If any of you die, if any of you die and leave widows behind, they shall wait concerning themselves four months and ten days. We are doing a guessing. They must wait concerning themselves four months and ten days. When they have fulfilled the term of waiting, the idda, when they have fulfilled the term of waiting, there is no blame on you if they dispose themselves in a just and reasonable manner. And God is well acquainted with what you do. There is no blame on you if you make an offer of betrothal or hold it in your hearts. There is no blame on you if you make an offer 
that you're going to marry her after the death is over, or you keep it in your heart. There's no blame on you for that. Allah knows that you cherish them in your hearts. But do not make a secret contract with them except in terms honorable. No result on the, on the tie of marriage till the term prescribed is fulfilled. You see, four months and ten days, anybody could have guessed. In a thousand guesses, anybody can come. Somebody can come right. Is it not so? Because you guess as a three months. Somebody says three months, ten days. Somebody says four months. Somebody says four months and ten days. If somebody can guess and get that, that figure. There's nothing miraculous about that. But the miraculous nature of that message is this. That this is not the work of Muhammad sallallahu This is not his handiwork. Any clever man could have told you four months and ten days. You know, a guess. Your guess is as good as mine. Somebody could have guessed four months and ten days. So he guessed it. If he did. But no. That is not the miraculous part of this revelation. The revelation says that when the man has passed away and you feel that you can give this woman protection in marriage, you can offer to her that look, Sister-in-law, Habib, look, when your term is over, I'm prepared to take you in marriage. I'll look after you and the children. Ah, I shall be elated. She will be. This is, I've lost my looks, half a dozen children, all this liability, who's going to take me now? In the marriage market, is not the same as what she was before marriage. So here comes along this old man of 66. <laughs> look, nobody, I'll look after you. Oh, she's elated. This old man is going to give me protection, sir. So I said, you happy? She is very happy. I said, Imam Sahib, Imam Baker. Look, she's agreeable. Make our nikah. So he said, al nikahu min sunnati, faman raghiba an sunnati, falaysa minni, au kama qal. Finished. Tied her up. Now, she's still passing through that emotional upset. And she thinks, hey, this old man, <laughs> he's beating his wife, starving the children. What is going to do to me? Too late. Too late. Now to break up that marriage is hell for her. She's tied up. Emotionally, she was in no position to make up her mind. So Allah knows his creation. He knows. So you, you're going to take unfair advantage over that woman. He says, look, you can suggest to her marriage. Or keep it in your heart. But don't tie her up. No marriage contract until four months and ten days are over. By that time, the woman has chance to think and to see. She says, mm, no, 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 no. I can do without, you know, marriage for some time. And inshallah, you know, some better man might come along and look after me and my children. She doesn't stampede getting caught. Now, who knows that? The omnipotent, omniscient being. He knows our hearts and minds. He knows that you're going to take unfair advantage. So I said, that is not the work of Muhammad. Can you see? In every verse, every teaching of the Quran, when you analyze it, you say, this is not the work of man. This is not the work of man. This is not the work of man. With one verse, he killed four evils. One verse. There's not another religion on earth. No religion has succeeded to the extent that Islam has succeeded. One verse. Say, Ya you amanu. So, oh, you could believe. O oh, men of faith. Innam al khamru, so most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru, and gambling, wal ansabu, and fortune telling, wal aslamu, and idol worship, rizm bin amal shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fastani buhu la allakum tuflihun, so shun such abomination that you may prosper. And we have prospered. Alhamdulillah, we have prospered. You know, we have done very well. We Muslims. Our pound, shilling, and pence have gone more further than anybody else. Simply because we heeded the warning. Don't drink and don't gamble. We don't say we are all angels, but as a people as a whole. Our 500 runs a month will go further than that of the Indian Hindu, or the Indian Christian, or the colored Christian, or anybody else. Your 500 runs a month will go further than his 500 runs a month. The white man, or the colored, or the Indian, or the African. Simply because... Your religion says, don't touch that stuff and don't gamble. That you may prosper. And we have prospered. Now, we must share this. My dear brothers and sisters, this is what we have to do. We are here for is to share this goodness, this happiness. We want to change the environment. 
Because if we will not change the environment, the environment is going to change us. It's changing us. When you tie a horse to a donkey, the donkey doesn't bray. I'm sorry, the horse doesn't bray, but it lifts up its head like a donkey. And we are that donkey. We are lifting up our heads. We are trying to imitate the foreign culture. We are trying to behave like monkeys. We are trying to behave like donkeys. When we are not made for that. So, safety lies in changing the environment. And Allah Baris Allah's promises with us. He says, Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda. He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, wa deen al-haq, and with the religion of truth, li yuse hirahu ala deen kulli, that it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other way of life. Wa lahu kani al-kafirun. Now mind, how many unbeliever might not like it. And he repeats the same formula in the Quran again. So who allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda, wa deen al-haq, li yuse hirahu ala deen kulli, now, man, how the mushriks might not like it. The associators, people who associate other beings with Allah. Even Wahmat. Then again, he repeats the same formula three times. And he says, Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah as a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. Don't forget. Don't think Allah is dependent on you, on me. That without you and me, his deen won't go. I said, Look, he will substitute in your place another people. That if you do not fulfill your duties and obligations, this is his promise, his warning. He said, He will substitute in your place another people. Then they won't be like you. They won't be like you. And it has happened again and again in history, and it can happen again. Allah has sent us here to this country for a purpose. Your forefathers were brought here against their will, they were brought here as slaves and sold to the white men as slaves. Therefore, you carry the names today. Muhammad Hendricks, Abdullah Fisser, Daud Fenter. Where did you get on this one? Your slave masters. You didn't come here on your own free will. They brought you by force from your motherland in Indonesia and Malaysia. Allah had a purpose. As he had a purpose with Bibi Hajra. Imagine a young lady, a young girl with a little infant child and a friend of Allah, Khalilullah Ibrahim, he's made to go and leave that Young girl, young wife of his with that infant child there in Makkah. Can you imagine? Can you account for it? Did Hajra like that, that little child? Did he love it? No. But Allah had a purpose. Allah had a purpose in sending you here. Allah had a purpose in sending my people here. We were starving, therefore we came, my people. You were brought here against your will. Allah had a purpose. Because today, no Malaysian can come to this country. No Indonesian can come to this country. No Pakistani can come to this country. You know that? No Indian can come to this country. You are here, you are here. You are here to do a job of work. If you don't do that job, you'll get lost. You'll get wiped out, you'll get absorbed. It's about time that you turn the tables. You don't have to wait for people to come and knock at your door. Bring your brothers and your brother-in-laws. Your brother-in-laws, both ways. There are brother-in-laws you have, both ways. Change them before they change you and your people. Wa'akhir da'wanan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Thank you, Brother Ahmed. Before we start with the questions, and obviously the answers, I'd just like to have, make mention of a few things. Number one, please do not forget that there are other lectures right up to Tuesday evening, the last one on Tuesday will be, Is Jesus God? That will be in the Kensington Civic Center. The one on Saturday evening will be in the City Hall, Crucifixion with an X, or Crucifixion, C-T-I-O-N. Please take these pamphlets, where they are put outside, and spread it to your friends, your relatives, and your neighbors. On Saturday. On Saturday evening at the City Hall, the free booklet to be handed out there is Crucifixion with an X or Crucifixion, C-T-I-O-N. This will be distributed free on Saturday evening at the City Hall. Then tomorrow evening, because it's the closest one, it will be in the Retreat Civic Center. And the topic for tomorrow evening is Muhammad the Greatest. Then also... After the questions and answers, translations of the Quran by Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali will be available here 
at 750 per copy, if you buy two, it's 10 rand. Give it as a wedding gift. It is the cheapest, it will be the most appreciated. Tons of weddings, you don't know what to buy, you buy chandeliers, they break next week, you buy pots, they get stolen, nobody steals Qur'an. See, that is scared, doesn't want to read it, you see. Give it the Qur'an, it's cheap. Then, about questions, I would like you to, mean to, to understand, please, that when a brother comes up with a question, he goes to the microphone at the back, he puts his question briefly, and he's entitled to get an answer. If you do not agree with the the mannerisms of the brother, if you do not agree with the question he put, please don't shout him down and please don't mock him. Every person is entitled to his question. And when, if there are more than one person, they can queue at the back. One condition, one question per person at a time. Don't give three questions in one breath. Give one question, and if there are people after you, go back at the end of the line and give your next question. Please, 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 it is unpleasant for me to stop a person and say, sorry, you're giving a lecture, put your question, but I will do that. Put a question, please. It's over to you now for question time. Anybody who's got a question, please proceed to the microphone in the aisle on the far side. One reminder for the other lectures, you are free to bring cassette recorders, you are free to bring video uh, machine mechanisms to make your films if the people of the halls will allow you. Thank you. You may start, brother. Good evening, Mr. Didat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Didat asked the first question, which I would like to answer myself. He said, if you can prove me to be a liar, do so. And I would like to do this now. In 1 John 2, we read, who is a liar? It is a man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. I think that is the answer perhaps to the one question. And the second one question I would like to ask, the Bible first of all in 1 Peter 2 verse 22 says very clearly that Jesus Christ never committed any sin. You ridiculed our Lord Jesus Christ in a very terrible way. It says here, and Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he writes, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So I would like to please uh, to ask you, it is not fair to ridicule someone with the word of God. And I would like to ask you not to do it anymore because you are actually sinning against the Holy Spirit who was given according to the scripture 10 days after the ascension of Jesus Christ and not 600 years uh, when Muhammad came, the Bible says, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you will receive the Holy Spirit. The disciples never waited for 600 years, 10 days. And the Holy Spirit came and enabled them to remember everything. With Jesus in his love, in his compassion, in his surrender to God, brought to them. And he gave his life to give us eternal life. Thank you. Uh, what you have done, my brother, is... You have made some statements. You see, when you say I ridiculed, I, when I was quoting those verses, I was make, asking and pleading, please make a note of chapter and verse. I am only quoting scripture. Now, if you construe that as a mockery, when Jesus says, you hypocrites, did he say that? You generation of wipers, you whited sepulchers, you wicked and adulterous generation. Did he say that? Yes, he said so. Now, are they would, I would assume he would say, say the same thing to many of us here. What I am saying is now, was I quoting correctly? Yes, but out now, of was context. That a, was that a mockery? Out of context. Jesus Christ. What is the context in which he said, woman, what have I to do with you? The context is that Jesus said, I haven't found such a faith and it will be done as you request. I beg your pardon. You don't know your scripture, brother. I Look, I I'm quoting from John chapter 1 where Jesus Christ at that marriage feast at Cana. You remember they ran short of wine? Yes. Jesus. And, I'm speaking. When they ran short of wine, his mother comes to him and says, look, my son, these people have run short of wine. Do them a favor. So he said, woman, 
Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Woman, yes. What's wrong what have you? I to do with you? Yes. What have I to do with you? Is that what you call your mother, woman? He never, in the term of the Bible, it was not a word which was negative. It was a very... Uh, you, it in, was in your language, do you know Hebrew? A little bit. You know, what is the word for mother in Hebrew? Um. Mm -hmm. Didn't Jesus know that word, um? Mm? What does it mean? Mother. Right. Why does he call her woman? Woman does not mean in this context. But you are I, negative. I, I was only I, quoting you, my I brother. I quoted to you that the Bible says Jesus never sinned. We, with his mouth, no, it's actually. we Muslims, we say Jesus never sinned. Right. We believe. So why we do believe, you We believe. Look, I said, this is your record. I'm only presenting your record to you. I want you to tell me how does it come about that when his mother goes looking for him and he says, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Yes. Why don't you see the context? If you were that mother, if you carried him for nine months, you. Yes. And if your son tells you, who is my mother, how do you feel, my son? I ask you, how would you feel? Good question. May I answer you? Yeah, answer. Jesus says, those are my mother, those are my brother, those who do the will of my father. And his mother did the will of the father perfectly. When she conceived the Holy Spirit, she said, thy will be done. And that it was exactly the words of Christ too. So in other words, Christ actually lifted up his mother with all other people who trusted in him fully, fully and really walked with Christ and by, obeyed the will of God. Right, next question. Up. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say Mr. Ahmadidat, I'm sorry to say it, I am the one of last night it was course I had Afrikaans Bible. Now, Mr. Amadidat, now I talk to you English as I have learned it, not as I have learned somewhere else. I have not grown in a country, Catonians, as Thank you said, you, a bilingual. Brother, I spoke now, to you, sorry, I spoke to you earlier on outside. Thank you for that. He was the fellow of last night. Could you put your question, please? Now, okay. Now, this is only the clarification on that. Now, Mr. Amadidat. You see, when a person quotes a scripture, he mustn't quote a part of it. He must quote it as from A to Z, because I believe A till Z is the whole and the full alphabet. Okay. Now here it says in that scripture of the woman, of the Canaanite woman's faith. I'll read it from the chapter 4. Then just to prove it, that Jesus also later on said so. Here it says, But the ants then said, I am not sent unto the lost sheep, that is what you said, the house, but sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. You see, there Jesus tested the faith, and she said, Through the Lord, you the dogs, you the crumbs, which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, but it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And the daughter was made whole that very moment. Thank you. I don't know what the question is. Could I ask the next question, please? Thank you. Brother? No, please. Thank you. Over to you, brother. Was the Bible ever, or is it partially the Word of God, or not at all? We Muslims, we believe that in the Bible, you do have the Word of God. Like, for example, I was dealing with verses last night, where God Almighty, He speaks, He said, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. We know on the very face of it that these are the words of God. Then we read again, like in the book of Isaiah, said, I, I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. We recognize that God is speaking. Then you have another type of evidence in the Bible, which can we, we can attribute to the prophets of God. 
Like for example, Jesus, he says, it has been said by them of old time, by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, these are his words. It has been said by them of old time, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, had committed adultery with her already in his heart. These are the words of a prophet of God. So you have a type of uh, in the Bible, which we can recognize as the word of God. There is another type of evidence which we can recognize as the word of the prophet. Then there is another type of evidence in the Bible, which people are writing from hearsay, as an eyewitness or a ear witness or from hearsay. For example, he said, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a fig tree with leaves. Happily, he, Jesus, came up to it, wanting to find figs thereof. But when he came, there was nothing but leaves, for the season was not yet. Now, these are not the words of God. These are not the words of Jesus. These are the words of an eyewitness or a ear witness or somebody writing from hearsay. Then there is another type of evidence also in the Bible, which is too horrible for me to, to read. Too horrible. You read that in Genesis chapter 19, verse 30 onwards about Lot and his two daughters. Night after night, how they seduced the father. Genesis chapter 38, you read there about Judah and his daughter-in-law by the roadside. What they did. Committed incest. Now, that type of thing, we say it is not the word of God. It is not the word of the prophet. It is some pornography that was circulating. They put it into a book. So we say that in the Bible, the word of God is there. In the Bible, the word of the prophet is there. In the Bible, history is there. And in the Bible, pornography is there. All these things are in one volume. We in Islam, we have a great advantage over every other religion in this. That the Quran, we say, is the word of God. It's a volume by itself. Then we have the words of the prophet. We say hadith, tradition, volume by themselves. Then we have our historians writing history, volumes by themselves. And we also have filthy, dirty stories, which were circulating among the Arabs before Islam, what they call the Arabian Nights. But it is not in the Quran, it is not in the Hadith, in the, not in our books of history. There are books of pornography. So all these things are in separate volumes. Whereas with the Bible, you have everything mixed in one. So now you have to start sifting. So we Muslims, because of our training, we can recognize these different types of evidences in the book. Sorry? Could I have the next question behind? There's somebody behind you. You've put right, hang on a second. Uh, I haven't actually answered at all. I, I've, I hear that. But now, the statement is that the Bible is part pornography, part the Word of God, and has been changed and adulterated over the years. Is that correct? Now, and now you asked me a question. I said, that is what the Christians say. You see, the Christians themselves, they say like this. You see this book here? This is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. I wonder if you've seen one. This is called the Douay version or the Reims version. It has got 73 books inside. Sure. The Apocrypha as well. Right. <laughs> no, that's the, the Catholics don't say Apocrypha. It's you. The Protestants say it's Apocrypha, which you mean is doubtful, not authentic. So you have expunged it from your authorized King James Version. You see those seven books. So, with then, all respect, Mr. D. Dadzo, with all respect to you, uh, I know I, you don't want me to talk long, but the Quran states that nobody can change the words of Allah, and the word of God cannot be changed in the 10th surah and the 6th surah. Yeah. Now, if the, the Bible was ever the word of God, how could it have been changed if it Allah was, and God are the was, same people? It, the word of God can't change. When said, God is one. So, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the prayer. Our God, the Lord, is one. Now, you can't change that. You see? But now, in that book, if you add something else to it and something as your own, your history, your so prejudice. You're saying the word can be altered and changed. But it's not the word of God is being changed. You see, now you say that the Bible is the word of God. So, and you took out seven books and you threw them away from your book from the King James Version. Seven you threw out from here. You have to admit that. You threw out seven of these books. This one is yes. yours. The Catholic Bible. The Catholic Bible was the first Bible, the Dwey rings. When the Bible, when the actual Bible was put in AD 350, there was no Catholic church as, as such. Right, you didn't have this either. 
There, didn't, no, there, uh, there was a Bible as we have it today, complete at that stage. There never was a Bible in this form at all. Of these books that you have, they have been canonized. That is your word, but that is not historical fact either, Mr. Didat. All right. But now what you have in front of the, now, now, today, you have this book, the authorized King James Version, which the bulk of Christendom use, King James, with this revised standard version, RSV, Book. thrown out a lot of what has been in here That's it. and this is done by Christian scholars of the highest eminence 32 Christian scholars the, of the highest eminence back the word, 50 cooperating denom of God they even published the uh, in the surah I hope you have heard here uh, the most I will was ever the piece of the Bible how the chapter of Isaiah <laughs> which points to the Jesus Christ the the fight for the sins of mankind the God is um, was very I did not see scrolls complete pointing to the Messiah what altered unchanged for 2,000 years why do you some else and some else your and read that tonight to the people your and, and give them one thing but uh, of the Bible read from the Bible complete is the testament of the Jews I challenge to do that tonight do you want me to do, brother? Read his words. Seven chapter of Isaiah. Huh? Yes. Bible, which the Jews or this book, this one Christ have not thrown out or changed. The Catholic was found in a Dead Sea Scroll. Read, where, read that to the people tonight. Then, not your word. You, you believe from, as such. Right. You didn't live in the Dead Sea Scroll. Uh, there, uh, there was a. I uh, challenge you, Mr. D, that to that stage. Word of God as I believe to the people. Uh, the, uh, you do refuse to read the word of God. This is the word that is what I refuse to do is this that I write. Now what you have it to this meeting one and I swim power to prove to you King James. Jesus Christ prophesied about Muhammad version. And I gave you reason in book throughout out of which you or any Christian and done not been able to contradict as to questions. Will you give me time to contradict you? The word at the, the floor. This is question time. Even understand the meaning of question time. Yes. Uh, you have here. Question me on what I've said. Was the made right. my case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Describe the word uh, First of all, I would come good evening, everybody, and Halted, unchanged for two. I did Why? some else and some as you me to attend your lecture and give them a. I haven't got a grudge against you, but uh, you from the Bible, it was always my desire. The Jews and my heart did go out for you. Cry because the of our presses seven chapter was yeah. all our brethren is, is pressed to choose his book. This actually. Who to the Catholic was found dead to explain to me it because tonight then I would like to ask about the comforter. So that you didn't even say to myself that Jesus could even ask Jim that that's to his disciples who say that you are you do refuse, but I always think in this direction I refuse to do this that I can can take the place even of Jesus uh -huh. yeah. of the comforter. He could even point it to the disciples who so prove to you, you will be the comforter. But I'm going to read it to you and to me. It's John chapter 14, it's you or verses 16 and 17. And I will pray and predict. And he shall give you another comforter that he may the word fear of ever, even the, the spirit of truth whom and meaning of question time receive, because it see him not. Night, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall read again. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, uh, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of everybody whom the world cannot receive, because it seed him not, not hide him. But you know him, for he shall he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I always thought to myself... Uh, sorry, would you like the... I'm not finished yet. But you could Bible. explain that to you, please. Always. To explain that to you. Okay. Thank you. Jesus says, 
I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. So another means the, other than the one that is there. There was a comforter there. The Catholic, who, who was that comforter? Holy oh, Spirit. So he's talking about another comforter. But for him, not the Holy Spirit, but another. And that is Muhammad. Ash. According to your own admission now, look, Jesus is not that comforter. He's the Holy Ghost is the comforter. And he said, I will give you another. So this another is Muhammad. And he guided mankind into all truth. Can't you see? Another, you understand the meaning of the word another? That means the one is there. And that one you say is the Holy Ghost. So he's talking about another, which the world cannot receive because it wasn't there. But you are being prepared to receive him. You were prepared already. But his prejudice now that's coming in the way is barring you from accepting the man. And he's abiding with you forever. This is the book, the last and final revelation of God. So it is teaching, Sorry. it is teaching, are you interjecting me now? In his teaching, this is there forever. There won't be another after this. For 1,400 years now, there has not been another book that has yep. superseded this. This is the last and final revelation of God Almighty, which stands forever. Brother, out of fairness, could I, out of fairness, please not to ask to the persons behind you, could you the next question, then you could go to the back of the line. Like this. Okay. I'm not easy yet. Could the next person explain that, please? Out of fairness to him. Thank Good you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I want to greet you all in Jesus' name. Right. Glad to meet you. I'm here in no other name but in the name of Jesus. Mr. Chairman, I believe that this book contains the Word of God. Would you kindly explain to me if you would like to respond to 2 Corinthians 13 14 and explain to me, Mr. Didat? But after that, and this Mohammed, if you according to your mind, you better ask. This is not that. Uh, you don't expect me to do homework for you. Open the book, read, I will read it to the people. Wait, I read and, and the people stand. If you know what it is, Mohammed, question. What is then coming to? Can you? Trinity unto me, Mr. What is that? The Trinity. I mean, what I'm, was that the subject we were discussing this evening? The Holy Trinity? We were discussing, were we discussing Trinity? or Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. What were we discussing? Mr. Didak, you have denied the word of God from the very word A, and I, I, will, I will just challenge you, Mr. Didak, if I may. Already it seems that I'm, I'm not allowed to, but I would love you to explain the Trinity, Mr. Didak. All right, I'll explain to you. Thank you. You see, the Trinity is something that existed after the second world, long before Jesus was born. The Romans had that trinity. The Hindus had that trinity. And this trinity which the Christians are following today is not the teaching of Jesus Christ. You see, there is only one verse in the Christian Bible now where trinity is explained in the most simple and easy language, most distinctively. And that is the first epistle of Greek, chapter 5, verse 7 where it says, in the name. for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three, that is the closest to what the Christians believe in what they call the Holy Trinity. But that verse now has been thrown out of this Bible. And all modern translations of the Bible have thrown it out as a fabrication, as an interpolation. You don't have, I wonder if you open the book. I will all the modern translations of the Bible, they have thrown it out and question. When cut into interpolation, a fabrication. Do you know about that? Carry on. Thank you very much. Could we carry on to the next? Was that subject to discuss? Hold it, please. Silence. Next question. Um, sir, I... For Muhammad Najaf. Now bring the script to Mr. Ahmadidat. Mr. Ahmadidat, what do you think about those two scriptures? Uh, Deuteronomium, as you know it, 18.18, where it says, I will yes. set him up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, exist my words in his mouth.
and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's one. First thing, to who did Moses speak? Okay, is that, that is your right. question, eh? To whom did Moses speak? Right? Yeah. Moses didn't speak words. Those words were spoken by God to Moses. No, I don't ask. I ask, to whom did Moses speak? Don't ask. I know God speak, but it, the people with him, who was that people with him? Was it Arabians, Egyptians, Sodomites? Who was the people with him? Or you mean around him? When he, whatever was revealed to him, to whom did he first convey that message? Is that what you want to know? Yeah. Right. Right. He was speaking to the children of Israel in the first instance. Right, thank you. Now here is the question to use. Chapter 15. You say that this was Muhammad. Moses said this going to be Muhammad, but listen to this. Here it says, it says here, but he answered another word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who was in that? Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Dida, it is quite certain that you've made some deep studies into the Bible. And now, any casual reader of the Bible will know, as you will admit, that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as being present on the earth since creation. In Genesis already, the Spirit of God moved upon the deep. But Jesus spoke of a, the Holy Spirit coming in a different way. As a, one of the former questioners was 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 confused, you see, because it is quite easy to become confused with this vast crowd. You must be quite at home with the crowd like this, but, you know, uh, and, 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 and we're not trained for these things. No, so give is, me... What is the question? The question, you mean, Mr. Dida, do you admit that the Holy Spirit was on earth? You prove that, in fact, all for Christ, right from creation. When Jesus spoke of His coming, of the promised comforter. Surely he spoke of the Holy Spirit as coming in a different way. Because formerly the Holy Spirit abided with them. But now he would live inside of them eternally. It could not be Muhammad as you or, or, or the Quran. The teachings of Muhammad. Because it speaks of a person. A he. Muhammad is not with us now. So you, you answered the, a former questioner by saying that the teachings of Muhammad has been with us all these years, but the comforter is not the teachings of Muhammad. The comforter, according to you, is Muhammad. Now the Bible says, Jesus said, this comforter abides with us eternally, which means you are trying to tell us Muhammad is here with us now and abides with us all through. Thank you. If you go the scriptures once more again, your Gospel of St. Luke, you will read there about Lazarus or Dykes. You know, that there was a fellow simmering in hell. And he wanted Abraham to send somebody to dip his finger in the water and put it in his mouth. So he said, now look, between you and us, there is a barrier which we can't cover. So the man made a request, the one in hell. He said, allow me to go back and warn my brethren about the punishment that is awaiting them here if they don't mend their ways. So the answer that was given to them, that they have you at Moses and the prophets. Do you remember that verse? Have you heard that verse before? That they have Moses and the prophets. Is Moses here with us today? But that's what the Bible says, that they have Moses and the prophets. So Moses and the prophets, what it means is this, that in their teaching, Moses is with you. The prophets are with you in their teachings, 
Likewise, in an identical manner, Muhammad is with us in his teaching. You don't have to be physically present. Jesus is with us in his teaching. The words which he gave, they are with us. So he is with us. Moses, the teaching he gave, the Ten Commandments, they are with us. Teaching works. So it is not a physical with and not with. It is the teaching that they are talking about. That in the teaching, Moses is with us. In the teaching, Jesus is with us. In the teaching, Muhammad is with us. And Muhammad's teachings are going to abide forever. And Jesus told you, and I kept on repeating, that he says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go, I will send him. In other words, he was not talking about the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost was helping him in his ministry, helping the disciples in the ministry. And as you said, from the beginning of creation, the Holy Spirit was with everybody. So he was not talking about that. He's talking about somebody who will guide you into all truth, solve all your problems. And for 40 years, I've been asking learned men of Christendom, including your good self. I only want one new thing. One new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you in 2000 years, which Jesus Christ could not have given you because of your hard headedness. Brother, uh, thank you very much. Could I put it to you this way? There are, besides yourself, there are one, two, three, four, five, six people standing. But you see, it is very misleading if someone puts a question and Mr. Dida gives his, any answer he can give, and the people will accept it because I can't tell him now, but that is wrong. He can give any answer, anything he can say, but because I must get off now, it means everybody will go away with his answers. So the questioning is even more dangerous than the lecture. <laughs> Sorry, just hold it, brother, before you start. There are six of you there. We have time for three more questions because there's a limit on the time here, right? Could the six of you decide who puts the three questions? Please. Please. Okay. Yeah. We've got to leave the hall by half past, you see, and we've still got to pack up too. Okay, I would like to make it very brief. All right. Maybe I can get a brief answer. Mr. Muhammad, you, uh, Mr. Ahmed Dirad, you accuse the Christians and mankind as such of being in the sickness, of having the sickness of changing names. I think that's quite true. That is, you know, we all change names here and there. Uh, it's done, you know, by Christian who is converted Muslims, perhaps, and Muslims who is converted Christians. And you even said that if Muhammad would have died, before 40 years, uh, of his age of 40, we wouldn't have known about this man at all. Now, I have learned that the name of Muhammad was not, not actually Muhammad, but his name was Abu Qasim. Could you I've been asking. tell me what age was Muhammad? In which age was Muhammad when he became the title Muhammad? Because it is a very vital question. If you refer to question, when he became the what? I got it. I got the when he received the title Muhammad, oh. with what? Which age? When Muhammad was born. You see, as an infant, a little baby, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, took him to the Kaaba. You know, that was Abraham a great place, and yeah. his son Ishmael had, Abraham and Ishmael had built, and he presented this infant child to the leaders of the Quraysh. And they asked him, he say, named him, mm -hmm. and he said, Muhammad. He says, it's a very novel name, it's something new. We never had such a name before. He says, I want my grandchild to be praised throughout the world because Muhammad literally means the praised one. So from birth, the first name that was given to him was Muhammad. Please. Expression Abul Qasim comes later in history. The Arabs have a sister. You see that if you are the father of a child called Qasim, so you are Abul Qasim, the father of Qasim. You are Abu Ibrahim, the father of Abraham, mm -hmm. but you have your own name. So this is a respectful way of calling people by Abu Bakr. It's not his name, you see, but he said, now you are the father of Bakr. Mm -hmm. So this is Abu Qasim means of Qasim. If that was when a child was born and the name was given and this name. So Muhammad acquired that title as okay. the father of Qasim, but his name was Muhammad from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Um, the Muslim people um, now, I pray God opens everybody's eyes tonight here yeah, before they die. They always think to me to find out at the judgment day. Judgment day is too late. 
you either saved or lost forever on the judgment day. But anyway, um, they, do, they object very strongly to Jesus being called the Son of God. Mr. Didat said, honor your father and mother, quoting the word of God. Now, the Quran confirms what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Now, who was the father of Jesus Christ? Thank you. Uh, I will be dealing with the subject about the birth of Jesus in detail, but I will answer your question. We do believe that Jesus Christ was born miraculously, without any male intervention. We say this was the work of God. The Quran says, وَإِذَا قَدَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ أَبْكُونَ So whenever he decrees a matter, God Almighty, he merely wills it and the thing that you are being. So he was born without any male intervention. So your question so now God is, is his father. who is his father? So the Quran answers that. He said, Inna masala Isa, inna Allahi ka masali Adama. He said, the similitude or the example of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust. And he said to him, Be and he was who Adam, who was his father. Say, this is the that, father of Adam. Amen. That is, is the true. father of Jesus. And that is not funny. That is quite of that course. is quite true. There was no man or woman to conceive Adam. Right. So the first right. man had to be made by God. Right. By God, so God is his father. Of dust. Right. So and in the same way, there was no man who conceived Jesus Christ. His father is Almighty God. Jesus so, is the Son of God. So and now, every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, you can laugh at me tonight, all of you. Nobody is laughing but at I'm me. I'm telling you tonight that we are going to be judged by Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, and Jesus God, no matter what you get told. Uh, and um, I just I want each of you to spend as much time, your, your very salvation, your eternity, uh, depends on yourselves. Brother, Ahmed Didat cannot stand up on Judgment Day brother, and explain for you. Brother, you must explain for yourselves. Brother, thank you. Thank you. That was a, a lecture and a warning. I hope those people here take heed. But uh, I would like to remind you, first of all, of the Qurans that are for sale at 10 rand for two, and the free booklets and the pamphlets. But I wish to thank you very, very heartily for coming and all those who participated in question time. Thank you. Without any...